Russell Wilson, 373 yards, four touchdowns. Doug Baldwin, 10 receptions, 105 yards, touchdown. 433 yards of total offense. No turnovers. These sound like the types of numbers that you expect to hear when you come away with a win. How we doing, Hawk fans? This is Rob English, your SoCal Seahawk, and thank you for joining me on the week three post-game edition of Short Yardage. And here we go again. Uh, the Seattle Seahawks fall uh, in the Music City to the Tennessee Titans, uh, 33-27. to um, Another very poor showing by our boys, um, despite the numbers that were just previously read off. Um, another, another exhibition in just... It just seems like the Seahawks are finding ever new imaginative ways to lose. Um, The numbers are skewed. Uh, There was late success, but this is already after you're down. It's not uncommon for you to put up a bunch of yards late in the game that you're losing in. But, um, yeah, 433 yards total. I mean, we don't ever put up 400 yards of offense. And when we, historically, you know, or at least recently, when we do, we win. But not on Sunday. Uh, It was another very, very slow game for the offense. Uh, I believe we punted on our first six, uh, at least our first six possessions. Um, Managed to actually take the lead. I mean, the defense did their job again early in the game, the first half. Defense dominated. Um, it's really unfortunate that we have to say because the defense, our the Seattle Seahawks defense dominates other teams, uh, certainly in the first half of these games. Our defense dominates in the first half of these games. So far, three weeks uh, into the season, we've dominated the first half defensively. Now, one might argue that the other team's defense has dominated us, and that really isn't the case. I don't see these other teams' defenses dominating us. I see our offense not being able to get out of its own way. Um, and it just seems at this point, you know, it's kind of like a Murphy's Law thing. You know, whatever whatever can go wrong will go wrong for the Seahawks right now. Uh, uh, we've finally gotten the end zone against uh, against Tennessee late in the half. And with less than a minute on the clock, the defense is less than go right down the field, put up another field goal, and take the take a nine to seven lead into the half. Um, I think that really took a little bit of the wind out of the sails. Um, although with our first drive of the second half, we went down and scored again. Um, but it's just we we get tired of talking about the offensive line. We get tired of hearing about the offensive line. People say, stop blaming the offensive line. They want to blame Daryl Bevel. Um, they want to blame Tom Cable. And which is, which is essentially the offensive line. Um, the offensive line is not actually on Sunday pass block quite well. See, the Seahawks in the last few years have not been a great pass blocking, uh, um, team. The offensive line has not been great blocking for the pass, even when we're a Super Bowl team. But we've been great blocking the run. So it kind of made up for it. We've been a great run blocking team up until, you know, the last couple of years. Um, Russell Wilson, with his ability to get around in the pocket, um, you know, was able to kind of compensate for the lack of pass blocking ability. But more than that, the run blocking was so great. And we had a great running back 
and Marshawn Lynch, and even Thomas Rawls in his rookie season was running great. We had a great run blocking package. Um, we don't have that anymore. So it's not matter. It doesn't matter who we put back there at running back. It's not that Chris Carson is our savior or he's not. It's not that Thomas Rawls isn't a hundred percent or he's not or is or is not a hundred percent has nothing to do with that. It has to do with doesn't matter who you, you we could have, we could have picked up Adrian Peterson in the off season. You could put Barry Sanders in his, in his, well, Barry Sanders might be an exception, but what I'm saying is, <laughs> It doesn't matter who you put back there. The offensive line is creating zero space for these running backs. And that is a, you know, it's hamstringing the offense. We cannot sustain drives. Um, before we go any further, uh, before I, and I, I say, can't say before I forget because I did forget, but now that I've remembered, um, Seattle Sports Union, check us out. Seattle Sports Union, that's seattlesportsunion.com on the web, uh, at Seattle Sports Union on Facebook, and at Seattle Sports U on, um, on Twitter. Check us out. Uh, all things, uh, Seattle Sports. Uh, catch us, uh, on Sundays at 8 p.m. for our live post game show. Um, and, or on night, on days where we play at night directly after the game. So this weekend, um, I think it's a Sunday night game that we play. So catch us directly after the game. Back to what I was saying. We're not able to, to sustain drives because we have zero running game. Now, I probably tend to oversimplify things. Um, and what I mean by that is I feel like I have the recipe for success for Seattle. Uh, what we need to do is change the offensive philosophy. And I know that's not something you do very easily. You don't just change your offensive philosophy. Did I say that right? Offensive philosophy uh, three weeks into the season. You don't just, uh, you know, throw your hands up and try something brand new. But there was a day when the Seattle Seahawks were a West Coast, West Coast offensive team. And I'm talking back in the days of Chris Warren, John L. Williams. We were mostly a, a West Coast offense. We've gotten away from that now, uh, with the Marshawn Lynch emergence. Um, and actually, even back, even even in the days that we had at Ricky Waters, you know, um, that was we, we ran a West Coast offense. But that changed with Pete Carroll. You know, we ran it we ran more of a power, more of a power run. Um, and then with the read option coming in, you know, things changed a little bit. But we've gotten away from that. What I would like to see, um, because it doesn't seem to be working now. The 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 style in which we run the ball now just simply is not working, and it has not worked. This is not new. What I would like to see is Seattle go to more of a West Coast offense. I'd like to see um, motion, you know, not the kind of motion you might get in like a, you know, a run and shoot type of offense, but, um, you know, uh, three wide receiver, single back formation, um, you know, and, and just run the run the uh the outs and ins run the hitches run the slants and um get the ball out quick and use that spread them out a little bit and then run the draw then run the read option run the delay um you know i i feel like we are not going to be able to be the team, at least at this juncture. We're not going to be able to be able to be the team that can just pound the football. We're not going to be able to run to throw. We might have to throw to run. And that's, that's kind of 180 out of what we've been doing, um, with our recent success, but I think that's where we need to go. Um, if you, if defenses start to adjust, to cover these receivers down the field, the running game will open up. It's just that simple. 
Um, but when you're running the ball against a stacked box, it's just not going to work. Not this, not with this Seahawk team. Running the ball against a stacked box with our, in our, in our current state, <laughs> our current state of the team is not going to work. It is not working. It's not going to work. On defense, um, despite what looked like a lapse, um, on Sunday afternoon in Tennessee, um, I don't think we don't, I don't think we have any, any, any issues there. Um, time of possession is huge. Our defense has spent most of the season on the field. In three games, Seattle has had the ball for 85 minutes. So now in the 60 minute football games. So what? Six times three is what? 18. So 180, 180 minutes. Seattle's had the football for 85 minutes and I'm rounding up. It's actually, it's actually less. I rounded up on, on two of the totals for a game when the seconds were, uh, above 40. I just gave the extra minute. So 85 minutes of total offensive possession in three football games. 85 mostly unproductive minutes. It's, and, and really that number is skewed because we played the lowly 49ers in week two. And honestly, even against the 49ers, Time of possession only really went so far our direction because we took control. I'm doing the quotations sign with my fingers. Control late in the game, if you want to call it control. Um, and we were able to run out the clock. So we, we, we added a, uh, you know, some minutes to our total, uh, late in the fort, late in the game against the 49ers. So, I mean, if you ask me, that number could have been less, could be far less. Um, and when you, so since we don't have the football, that means the defense is on the field. And when the defense has been on the field the majority of the time, you cannot expect them to make plays every single play. And that's where it comes in. Uh, that's where you enter in, in situations where you got, uh, receivers breaking, uh, screen passes for touchdowns and running backs getting around the corner. Um, you know, you, you make mental mistakes because these guys are tired. They're playing too much. One of the popular, um, you know, quick fixes for the Seahawks offense I hear from people on the interwebs. Uh, even some of my colleagues in Seattle Sports Union feel like the fix is to go more up tempo. Just go up tempo. You know, uh, every time at the end of the half we go up tempo, we get right down the field and score. Yeah. That seems on the surface like it would be the fix. But I tell you, it's not. The Seahawks have tried the up tempo thing before. Um, it doesn't really work. It really doesn't work unless you have a very efficient offense. You, you can't, you can't look to the up tempo, you know, you can't look, you can't look to the up tempo, uh, style to gain efficiency. You have to already be efficient. And then use up tempo. You know, one begets the other. You know, you can't, you can't look for efficiency by going up tempo, but you can, after already being efficient, go up tempo. Uh, what happens is if you're not efficient on offense, all you do is go three and out faster. That's it. Instead of taking all, uh, uh, you know, uh, 35 seconds between plays, you know, and, and being, having your offense on the field for a few minutes, you go one, two, three and out in one minute, <laughs> you know, of, 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 uh, of, of game, of game time or whatever, you know, uh, 
you're really going up tempo could make us even worse than we already are. Despite the fact that we seem to do better when we do it. But if you make that your philosophy, it, you, you stand a very, very good chance of just shooting yourself in the foot. You stand a very good chance of making thing, making matters worse. The defense is already fatigued. The defense is already giving up, th- giving up plays uncharacteristically because they're so fatigued, because they're spending so much time on the field. You go up tempo, even if you manage to get a first down or two. If you give up the ball, if you punt the ball away, you're just putting defense right back on the field before they've had a chance to, to get a blow. So I would imagine that Pete Carroll, John Schneider have heard the, 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 the chants of the fans. I imagine that the concept has even already been brought up in the front offices of the Seattle Seahawks organization. I, would say that they probably are hesitant, hesitant or just completely against going up tempo for the reasons I just stated. Up tempo is not the fix. You heard it right here first. <laughs> the fix is change is moving away from this power run. Because the power run is not working. You have to move away from the power run. Zone read. Possession passing is where Seattle is going to find their success. And through that, I think the running game uh, will open up. Let me make a few play calls. I'm telling you. Nobody believes me, but I'm telling you, you let, you let me get, give, give me the sheet, give me the clipboard, give me, give me all, give me the playbook. Um, give me three games. I'm telling you, I'll turn this team around. Paul Allen, give me a shot. So this week we're going to be heading home. We'll be defending the clink against a very, um, what is believed to be poor Indianapolis Colts team with no Andrew Luck. Now, um, nobody assumes that the, the San Francisco 49ers are a good team. Um, but we did not go in and, uh, just handle the 49ers. Uh, now one will say that, you know, you can't just expect to beat any team. These are NFL teams they're pros, any given Sunday and all that jazz. But when you, you know, when it, when it seems obvious that one team is far and above better than the other, um, you expect the final score and, and just the, the goings on of the game to, 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 to show that we look like a team that's just barely better than the 49ers. And we just barely beat the 49ers. And now we're going to play another team that we um, should be better than. But I'm not convinced that we're going to go and have the, you know, have the uh, Colts over, you know, uh, for dinner and, and, you know, and serve them up. I'm not convinced. I'm not convinced. And this should not suggest any, any lack of faith in my team or, 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 uh, you know, any fair weather fandom, fandom or fanhood. I am an objective fan. I'm the biggest Seahawk fan that you know. But I am not convinced that we go in, go uh, go in on Sunday night and and just walk over the uh, Colts where I feel like we should, but I don't believe that we will because we have not got our head on straight yet. And we're going against Frank Gore. And that doesn't make me very happy. Uh, because Frank Gore, uh, is permanently, permanently, just, you know, seared into my brain for just some of the, just the dirty, disgusting things that he did to us as a San Francisco 49er. I can't tell you how many times 
I mean, you guys were there. You saw. Frank Gore used to gash us when he was with San Fran. We would hold him down, hold him down, hold him down. Then you get six. And you hold him down, they don't get nine. You hold him down, they don't get four. And then he gets 62 in a touch. <laughs> you know, it, 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 it just would have happened. It was going to happen sooner or later. It kind of looked like the way the way the running backs, DeMarco Murray and um, and uh, Derrick Henry ran against us on Sunday. It was kind of like that. You hold them, you hold them, you hold them, and they bust one. You hold them, you hold them, you hold them, and they bust one. That that's that's what I the 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 game on Sunday was kind of what I remember Frank Gore doing to us back in the Kingdom. Now Frank Gore's got a few. Uh, Years on him since then. He's a little longer in the teeth these days, but he's still Frank Gore and our defense, um, spends way too much time on the field. It's, uh, it's a setup. Setup for, for just those types of uh, situations. So hopefully we can get things going. Um, again, we would, it would be great to be two and two at the end of the first quarter of the season. Um, you know, to, to end up one and three, that's tough. That's tough. We've got a lot of games. We've got a, quite a few games, um, both on the road and at home that really are going to, you know, be telltale, um, you know, situations as far as what we're going to be able to do. Uh, where we sit a game back in the division. Um, and we need that. We need to be two and two after Sunday night. So this weekend um, was pretty special. And yes, I know some of us are tired of talking about it, tired of hearing about it. But the protests during the national anthem was pretty big this weekend. Uh, a lot of teams, including the Seahawks and the Titans, um, chose to stay in the locker room during the playing of the national anthem. Uh, most teams locked arms or knelt or, or, you know, or did something, um, collectively. Uh, and I thought that was, I thought that was good. There's a lot of pushback from, from the general public, from the fans and, and, and whatnot. It's really unfortunate though that our president has, you know, poked his head into this, into this whole thing. As if, as if the topic, as if the, the point of the protest hasn't already been muddied, um, and lost in all this hoopla. The president now jumps into this and makes it about him. And let me tell you, the, the, the notion, it's, it's really quite asinine, if you ask me. And I am fully willing to accept the fact that I have my certain opinions about this, me being a black man in America, seeing things out of, through, through my eyes. I think everybody has that same Everybody has their own bias. And we really need to sit back and recognize that fact that everyone has their own bias. So instead of, instead of just pushing your own agenda, everyone should stop talking so much and start listening. Which is ironic because I'm sitting here in front of a microphone talking, but, um, the notion that this protest, even at, at its inception, is somehow anti-American is somehow disrespectful to to uh, the military disrespectful to fallen soldiers and the families of of, of these soldiers it's pure pure it, it's, it's nonsense it's nonsense that is only a deflection it, it's a it's a 
it's a it's a it's a notion that's been that's being perpetuated by folks who simply refuse to acknowledge the actual issue rather than saying okay i don't really like that someone is choosing to sit or kneel during the national anthem that i love so much rather than try to figure out why they're doing it I'm just simply going to be upset about the fact that they're doing it. So the message is just being completely looked over, looked right over. Now, the reality of this of this whole national anthem thing is it. Yes, the national anthem is a song. And. Uh, I mean, it's called the Star Spangled Banner. Okay, it's a song about a flag. Now, it means different things. To the flag means different things to different people. It means a whole world of difference to someone who's gone overseas and fought. Or just anyone who's served. Anyone, I should say, anyone who's fought for their country. Because fought and served, I think, should be separated. I think everybody serves their country. I serve, I pay taxes. I serve my country. Everything that any American does for Uncle Sam is serving his country. Now, have I gone to war and fought for my country? No, I have not. But tell me, what's... What is anti-American about it? See, the, the, you know, and I don't try to, I try to stay out of politics, but the, the, I guess you'll call it the right side, loves to say this, these, uh, temper tantrum throwing football players, you know, being anti-American and this is and perpetuating, uh, uh, hate of America. And are you, are you kidding? It's so silly. Hate America? Not a single one of these players who protest hate America. Not a single one of these players are anti-American. I promise you, none of them would like to live in Baghdad. Not a single one of them. What's more American and patriotic than using your platform to call to task the very country you love when it's not when it doesn't hold up to its very own creed the creed that these pissed off uh veterans and and servicemen and their families since they're apparently so pissed off the same creed that they go to fight for we can move past the fact that you know uh yeah, well, you know, they go fight for, for them to, for these guys to be able to make their protest. This, that's the great thing about America. Yeah, that, that's, that's academic. But they don't care about that. It really, I mean, really the conversation might, should be over right there. They go to war to fight for the freedom that each one of these people has to do exactly what they're doing. Yet it's not okay. That's counterintuitive. That's simply, Silly. I go to war and fight for you to be able to protest in any way you feel like doing it. But when you do it, I'm going to get upset. I guess that's freedom of speech too. You have the right to get upset about something. That's fine. But um, to suggest that these people are anti-American, it's not the case. I think it's more patriotic to do it during, to do it in the way that they're doing it, not less. The flag and its creed are they, they suggest freedom and equality for all the issue is a lack of that very thing so what better time to protest i've seen videos of people americans american people jumping on flags stomping on flags burning flags doing all kinds of things to flags and Colin Kaepernick decided that he was just going to be a silent non-participant in something 
that's really only a big deal re- more recently than, than anything. The NFL, with its rah-rah troops and rah-rah military thing, is very new. And you may not know this, but the military is really paying money. They're buying patriotism. The military pays the NFL to do much of this rah-rah troops, rah-rah military stuff that they do. They pay the NFL to hold down these spots in their stadium uh, for for um, for war war veterans and 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 servicemen and all that good stuff. They pay the NFL for these spots during during the uh, during the commercials. They pay the NFL to do all these things to bring uh, attention to the military. This isn't just something that the uh, NFL is doing because they love their military so much. And that is not, and, and let me clarify that I'm not saying that the NFL doesn't love the military and its soldiers. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is there's more to the story. Um, there's an issue with race. Race is the issue. And people try to act like they don't believe that race is the issue and don't understand why race is brought into it. Really, it's race. Um, you know, the, when, once you really peel back the onion and get down to the crux of it, it, race has its, its, its place in this conversation and it's unfortunate. Because the whole thing in its beginning was about race. It was about unarmed black men being shot by police unwarranted. It was about mistreatment of minorities by police across this country. It is about race. You've got people, uh, you really can find out about how people think when they when they make their comments on forums where there's little or no, um, you know, uh, repercussions or, or accountability vis-a-vis the web. They say that these, these, these athletes are just throwing temper tantrums. Throwing a temper tantrum. As if standing up, as if standing up for the rights of your fellow Americans is somehow not patriotic and is somehow anti-American. You've got people in these stadiums booing during the actual singing of the national anthem. How was that patriotic? Just because there's someone taking a knee. They boo during the actual song. (laughs) People say that, uh, these, these athletes shouldn't have anything to complain about because they're rich. That's another one of the stupidest, um, retorts to this whole thing that I've heard. Um, is it, that's just like saying, oh, racism is a, isn't, you know, isn't a thing anymore because we have a black president or we had a black president. You see in the videos on the YouTube, oh, uh, you know, Black people uh, don't have opportunities and they show the, they show a one rich black person or three or four rich black people. As if the fact that there's a few rich black people, meaning that uh, black people aren't still the most disenfranchised uh, people in this country. These people are, f- are standing up for some, for an injustice, an injustice. And you say, and you diminish their message. By calling them crybabies and saying that they're being troublemakers. It, this is really, this is really no different than it was back in the fifties. It's the same thing. A peaceful protest was met with venom, with hate, with all the above. Peaceful protests, sit-ins were met with violence, marches, were met with dogs and fire hoses that can take the skin 
off of a person. Batons. Nightsticks. And now you have a silent me. Or a silent butt on a chair. Being met with a barrage of hate speech. I don't know, do, do most people know that when Colin Kaepernick first started this, he was sitting down. And it wasn't until it wasn't until um, a former army uh, Green Beret even uh, and short time NFL football player played for the Seahawks uh, Nate, Nate Boyer, I believe his name was Nate Boyer actually sat down with Colin Kaepernick or spoke with him. I don't know if they sat down together or spoke over the phone or whatever, but they spoke. And this former Green Beret is the man that actually made the su- suggestion to Colin Kaepernick that he kneel rather than sit. An actual former serviceman, a veteran in this country, is the one who actually suggested that you should kneel rather than sit. And the reason behind that was because servicemen oftentimes take a knee before the flag or wherever they do it to to, uh, uh, to show respect for their fallen soldiers. When, show, when, when, when showing respect for fallen soldiers, live soldiers, often take a knee or two. So Nate Boyer thought, hey, and the, and, the, and the two together said, wow, you know what? That'd be very powerful. Let me do like you guys do for our fallen. I'm going to kneel for our fallen. But no, no one wants, no one wants to see it like that. No one wants to see it like that. People will only see it as disrespectful. And this isn't to say that everyone who is mad about him kneeling is racist. Race is an issue. But it doesn't, I don't think that everyone who, everyone who, uh, is mad at him for kneeling is racist. Not at all. It's bias. For sure. I might feel differently if I had served in the military. I have family that serves in the military. So does Colin Kaepernick. But the one truest freedom we have as Americans is the freedom to take our own country to task when it fails at its promise. People say, don't do it during the game. Don't do it about on the flag. Don't do it. Uh, when do you do it then? When do you do it? When should Colin Kaepernick, you know, make his point? When he's sitting at home on his couch? It's a protest. A protest is supposed to be done when it makes you uncomfortable. That's how it gets done. What, do you want Colin Kaepernick to uh, stand outside of a Walmart to do his protest? When Muhammad Ali protested by not going to war, he was destroyed for it. When Tommy Smith and John Carlos raised a fist during the Olympics, they were destroyed for it. When Martin Luther King marched peacefully and sat in peacefully, he was destroyed for it. It's only all these many years later that these people are revered for their bravery and their willingness to sacrifice for the greater good. And after all these years, here we are still fighting the same fight. The same thing is still happening. One or a few people stand up for what's wrong and the majority who ultimately is not affected by this wrong, 
destroys them for it, for speaking out. Hopefully in 50, 60 years or 30, 40 years or whatever, we'll see Colin Kaepernick in the same light that we see Martin Luther King and Muhammad Ali as humanitarians. But we, we act like we've come so far since then. We really haven't gone nowhere. Cause the same thing is happening. Alright, Seahawk fans, that's gonna be it for, uh, short yardage. Uh, we have the Indianapolis Colts on Sunday night football. Hopefully we can go in there and get a win and, uh, end up two and two after the first quarter of the season. And uh, looking to see some uh, big changes from the Seattle Seahawks. Uh, check us out on Seattle Sports Union. Again, that is seattlesportsunion.com on the web, at Seattle Sports Union on Facebook, and at Seattle Sports U on Twitter. Check us out. Catch our show uh, directly after the game on Sunday night on uh, Facebook. And uh, like, follow, and subscribe. Uh, this is Rob English, your SoCal Seahawk, signing off. Go Hawks.